Hi, this is Dr. Bob Dannenhofer, the Public Health Officer for Douglas County. It is the uh, day before St. Patrick's Day, uh, March the 16th, and uh, this is another one of our updates here. We've been doing this now for exactly a year, and uh, we've got some pretty good news today, so we'll start with that. But this is time for you to ask questions. So if you have questions, either put them at Facebook questions at douglaspublichealthnetwork.org, or since you're doing it right now, if you'll put them in the chat section, Kristen, I think, has taken them tonight. She's going to write them out for me, and we'll take a look. Again, if you write a really long or complicated question, it's hard for me to do it on the fly. But I look at these at the night of, and we'll get back to people with what we know. As always, we start at the world level and then move down to the Douglas County level. In the world, um, 120 million cases and 2.6 million deaths. There's been a clear uptick in cases in the world. So the number of cases in the world had been going down, but it's very clearly up now in the last 7 to 10 days. We're seeing a lot of disease in Europe, especially Sweden, Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary, and most worrisomely, Italy. Italy had their peak a couple of weeks before our first peak, before our second peak, before our third peak, and now they're having a spike again. So Italy preceded each of the past three spikes, and it's worrisome to see that Italy is again having a little spike. Now, maybe we will not follow the last three, but the history is the best predictor of the future, and in this case, that makes me worried. We're also seeing a lot of disease in the Middle East. Uh, started in Israel and then moving out. Now, Israel has done a very good job with immunizations, but they continue to have a lot of cases. We're also starting to see it heat up in Africa, and Africa is one of my big concerns. As you remember, Africa's had not very much disease during this whole pandemic. The thought is that maybe there's not a lot of travel in Africa, or maybe that was there and people didn't pick it up, but at least antibody studies suggest that this disease has not been widespread in Africa. The concern is if it does become widespread in Africa, it'll start off with a disease which has already mutated, is already a variant, and the worry is that in the very, very, very dense places of Kinshasa or Lagos or uh, Nairobi, that this is going to just just spread further and mutate further. And if they mutate in those areas, there's really no way to keep mutations out of a country, and that would be a big worry. In the U.S., we're at 30 million cases, almost 550,000 deaths. Although our case count has come down to about 50,000 a day, it's still 50,000 a day, and our death rate has come down, but still more than 1,000 a day. So it is kind of worrisome. Uh, there are not a lots of hotspots, but there's some places that are a little worrisome. There's some hotspots in Colorado and some hotspots in Utah. But especially when I look at the southern Texas coast, where those little barrier islands are outside of that with Corpus Christi and south, and south Florida are two of the areas which are the hottest areas in the country. And what's worrisome is that as we start spring break week, that's the place that a lot of people are going to go. They don't come to Roseburg for spring break. They go to places like south Florida. They go places like south Texas. And the concern is that it's already hot there. And we know in, in south Florida there are a lot of variants that people come from the various states in the north, go down to those areas there, pick up the disease. They're young people, so they won't be very sick. Go back to where they're at and then spread it where they're going. So that does that does worry me. In Oregon, our cases are down, although when you look, it's really sort of flattened at a level and it's not going down any further. In Oregon, we're seeing a weird increase in cases in southern Oregon, especially Coos County. So of all the counties in the state, Coos is currently the hottest. And this has been a problem because we've had some people at Reedsport who uh, live in, who work in Reedsport and live in Coos or live in Reedsport and work in Coos, bringing the disease back and forth out to the Reedsport area. And then some cases here associated with, we think, a church in, in Coos County. So we, we worry because it is close. This disease knows no borders. And if people travel back and forth, they'll bring it back. In Douglas County, I'm pleased to say that our, our peak that we had three or four weeks ago is now starting to come down. Yesterday we had three cases, five cases, maybe 10 cases in a day. So it's really coming down. And when we look, most of the outbreaks we're seeing now are workplace outbreaks. We're still seeing some school and church cases, but it's mostly workplace outbreaks. Workplace outbreaks are, are worrisome because 
People who work then also have kids who go to school. They have spouses who work at other places. So we're carefully following them. But none of these outbreaks have been particularly large. In terms of uh, testing, testing looks like it's good. On vaccine, the supply looks like it's increasing. I got some briefing today that we're expecting a loss of doses in April. And we get lots of doses in April, we'll be able to vaccinate more people. We hope by April the, the uh, eligibility will be opened up so that people over 45 with any underlying condition, people who work in some frontline industries can all get vaccinated. So that's a good sign. We did a big drive-through event, over 700 doses given this past Saturday. It worked pretty well. It wasn't, wasn't perfect, but it worked pretty well. We're going to do that again on April the 3rd, hopefully even do it longer and more doses. So we're hoping to get this out there because I think vaccination is our best way out. So people always say, well, Bob, will you predict the future? And as people say, predictions are really hard, especially about the future. What I can see is I can see paths to two very different futures. So let me give you the best case scenario. The best case scenario is that the cases are low and they're going to continue to stay low. That vaccines will get delivered at the time that we expect them to get delivered. That vaccines will be just as effective as we thought. And that there won't be any funny side effects reported from the vaccines and vaccine uptake will be high. The anti-vax movement, which is pretty potent at this point, will sort of melt away as people see how good and safe and effective the vaccine is. That the surge that we're seeing in Italy is limited to Europe. That Africa, which didn't have much disease before, never has much disease. <clears throat> and the variants that we see are fascinating, scientifically fascinating, but, but clinically unimportant that the vaccines still work well, that public health measures still work well. That best case scenario suggests that by really, by about the 4th of July, we're to an area where we're at community immunity, there's very little disease circulating, most of the people are vaccinated, and that come the summer, things are pretty darn good. And so I see a clear path to that. And so that's what I'm hoping happens. However, I also know enough to know that best case scenarios rarely happen. And usually we wind up somewhere between the best case and the worst case scenario. And what's the worst case scenario? Well, the worst case scenario is that these variants become the dominant strain. If the variants become the dominant strain, as has been predicted, as already has happened in other countries, a couple of things happen. One is that our regular public health measures don't work as well. Even with masking, even with distancing, cases still spread. And that's why the talk about double masking, whatever, when we worry about the variants. The second thing that happens is that the variants are more contagious. You need to get to a higher and higher and higher level to reach community immunity. So if this virus was as contagious as the original strains, you need 60 to 70% of the people immune. And that's why when they talked about community immunity six months ago, they were talking about 60 or 70%. Now that we have the 614 and some of the other variants, now people are talking about 70 to 85% of the people needed to be immune to, um, to get to uh, herd immunity. And if you get one that's really contagious with a, say, a, uh, a reproductive number of eight, there's just statistically no way to get to community immunity. We also worry that some of these new variants may be less well protected for by vaccine or previous infection. So right now we think if you've had a previous infection or if you've had a vaccine, you have at least 90% protection against being infected in the six months to a year after you get it. That's great. But imagine if there was a variant that decreased the effectiveness of previous infection or the vaccine from 90% to 40%. That would be really crappy. There are some, some stories of the Brazil variant may do that, so that's why we worry. We also worry that, I, you know, the worst case scenario is that Italy, which was a harbinger of the last three waves, will now be a harbinger of this wave, and that this wave that they're seeing in Italy comes to the U.S. And that some vaccine side effect will come up, which will scare people away. And so even in a rare side effect, even a one in a thousand side effect, 
is going to cause people not to do it, not to get the vaccine. And that could decrease the amount of people getting the vaccine and slow the path to getting there. So where do I think we're going to be? Well, with a long time, somewhere between the best case and the worst case. It is likely something, one of these worst case scenario things are going to come up. Either we're going to see a surge related to the European surge, that the variants will become more, more problematic and or there'll be some vaccine side effect that comes up. So, so there are some worries on the horizon. However, uh, the good news is if we can get people vaccinated quickly and keep the case round, counts low for a while, we really do have a good chance of having this summertime and next school year be much more like 2019 than 2020. Okay, let me get to the questions here. Okay, so here we go on the questions. So, so this is a longer question that I'm glad people did by Facebook Live. So it says, if a member of a household is a contact for a COVID patient outside the household, do we then need to contact the other people? So let's say there's a family, it's me and the family. I am exposed to so-and-so. Do then my family need to quarantine? The answer is we generally don't. So you would quarantine me and keep me away from my family. If you can't quarantine me, so my family and I living together in a one-room apartment or a studio apartment where you can't do it, that is higher risk. We generally do not do that. Now what we see is that my chance of getting the disease, if I'm a contact, varies. In some cases, it's, it's high. In some cases, it's slow. Overall, it's about 20%. If I would get it, then the chance that my spouse would get it is about 20%. And we think that rate is low enough that we don't quarantine contacts of contacts. Um, however, it depends upon how contagious this is. Now, we've seen some outbreaks that have a 100% attack rate. And then those people seem to have a 100% attack rate in their family. So this is a tough one to know about whether we should do that. So, Denise, that's a really good question. But I don't think we're going to change at this point. But you, you bring up a good point. So Denise also asks, what's the status of COVID vaccines for children under 16? We understand that the manufacturers are all testing this vaccine on kids 12 to 16 or 12 to 18, depending on which virus, it, which vaccine it is. And then I heard today that there are some studies going down to infancy. The best thought is that we might have clearance for using the vaccines down to age 12 by this fall. I think no one is thinking that we're going to have down to infancy until at least January of 2022. And also because kids seem to get sick less and transmit it less, the, um, the need to vaccinate them is less than 20 and 30 year olds who very clearly do spread it to others. So what's the plan of action if the variants turn out to be just as bad as we fear? Well, I think there's three things that we're going to do. One is we need to step up our public health measures. We know public health measures work for whatever virus you have. Masking, in this case, maybe double masking, uh, separations and lockdowns. But boy, we really, 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 really don't want to do the public health measures. The second thing on the variants is they're already working on a booster vaccine for the Moderna and the Pfizer that have the new and updated mRNA in it so that these should help to protect us against the variants. The problem with that is that it's going to take a while to get them going. We think about 100 days to get them approved and then another 100 or 200 days to get them made. So, so it, the first thing would be public health. The second would be um, would be the use of the vaccines. The third is one could see travel bans, because remember early on travel bans were used to keep things out. We might see that again. I would hope we don't have to go there. Uh, so Paul says, it looks like the presumptive cases are trending down. Are we just testing less people recently? 
The answer is no. So two ways of things we look at, the number of positive tests and the test positivity. So if you, if you had the same number of cases but tested half as many people, your positivity rate would double. Actually, our positivity rate is down, and our number of tests is about the same. So I don't think the cases trending down are because we're testing less people. He asked the next question, has anyone tried to predict the number of folks who had COVID but were asymptomatic? And there is a, there are three ways that they've done that. So the first is when they've looked at an entire population. So started off with the Ruby Princess where they tested everybody on the boat. They found that 30, 40% of the people were asymptomatic and remained asymptomatic later. The second is in the Navy study where they looked at the people on the aircraft carriers and again, anywhere from 20 to 50% of the people were asymptomatic when they've looked at the military studies. Another way to do it would be to look at antibody levels. So if you find, for example, 10% of the people have positive antibody levels, but only 2% of the people actually were diagnosed with a case, then you would say that we're catching about one in five cases. The other way to do it is there's some mathematical sampling that suggests that we're picking about one third of the cases and that about 71 million Americans have had the, the uh, infection and about 26 million of those had been picked up, so about a third. So I think the story, uh, the other way to do it is we look at Red Cross. Uh, so every time you give a blood donation, they look for COVID antibodies. They started early on. Nobody had the antibodies and it's crept up. In Oregon, it's three to 5% of the people have antibodies. About in Douglas County, about 2% of the people have had the infection. So mm, that's about a third of the, the numbers. So that's about right. So I think, um, so I think when we look at that, some of those people who were not found otherwise, some were asymptomatic and some probably had it but chose not to get tested or had it at a time when we didn't have enough testing. So I think. The answer is um, we can predict. These predictions suggest that the number of people in the U.S. who've had the disease and were asymptomatic, about 30% of the total number, maybe 25 or 30 million people in the U.S. So this next question is how will you do standbys for extra dose in the next clinic? We, I talked with a bunch of vaccine people today, and we... Um, we don't have the best way to do it. So some people have had just sort of a mad free-for-all. Some have had a sign-up for standbys. We tried that with one of our events and it really didn't work very well. Um, so if, you, if, if people are here, you've got the wisdom of the masses here. If you have a way that you would do the standby list for extra doses, and it's not just at the big event, but it's at clinics during the day, right? So a clinic has 10 doses of Moderna, they call in 10 people to get the vaccine. Turns out that only seven show up. So now they have those three extra doses and they're able to draw an extra dose out of the syringe. So now they get four extra doses. What's the best way to get to people in a somewhat equitable way, realizing that you only have a few hours to get it done? So it's not like you have five days to get it done. You typically have two or three or four hours to get it done. So I'd really be interested in people's ideas on how they might do that. So Veronica says, why do they call it the COVID vaccine if you can still get the disease? Well, that's what we call all vaccines. We call the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. You can still get measles, mumps, rubella. We call it the, the uh, smallpox vaccine. And although it was a very good vaccine, you could still get the smallpox. So that's just the way we call it. Now, you, if you wanted to be really scientific, you could call it the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. But I think that was considered to be uh, too complicated. But this is a great vaccine. So this is as good as any vaccine we've ever had. So if you look at the Moderna and Pfizer prevents about 75% of symptomatic, 95% of symptomatic cases, just as good as any vaccine we've had and far better than, for example, the influenza vaccine, which is probably at best 50 or 60% effective. So Michelle says, if levels have plateaued, why are there still mandates? Well, they plateaued they haven't gone down to a low level. Still 50,000 new cases a day. 50,000, that's a lot of cases. Still 1,000 deaths a day. I mean, 1,000 deaths a day from any, from any infectious disease would be considered extraordinary. 
So we still have a thousand deaths a day. It's a lot of deaths and the concern is that if people open up that you could indeed see an explosion in the number of cases. I do not know what's going to happen. Um, but 50,000, it plateaued. They have not really gone down a lot. We're still at a relatively high level of disease, not just in Douglas County and Oregon, but throughout the rest of the country. Um, so levels, uh, so they can explain the movement week and when it happened. So Oregon has decided to do these risk levels on a two-week period. The first week is called the movement week. Now, uh, the, the, the first week, the... So what happens is in the first week, they, they look at the numbers and they say where you think you're going to go. And in the second week, it's the measurement week. And they tell you where you're going to wind up to be. We're now right in the middle of that. If we continue with the same range, we're likely to move back down to the high range. We're, unless we have a lot of cases in the next three or four days, we're likely not to stay in the extreme range. And she says, are we still in extreme? Yes, we are now. But again, as of next Friday, so 10 days from now, it is likely we'll move down to the high unless we have a lot of cases in the next bit. So they measured until the, to the, until the Saturday night. They reported on Monday. They announced it on Tuesday. And then on Friday, it happens. So again, this Saturday night at midnight, they'll, they'll stop the measurement. On Monday, they'll, rep on Monday, they'll report it to me. On Tuesday, they'll report it to the state and tell what's going to happen next Friday, 10 days hence. So Sharon says, should I get my second Pfizer shot in the opposite arm? This is very interesting. Uh, when you get the shot, uh, much of the activity happens in the muscles, some of it's in the bloodstream. And so there, there's a theoretical reason that you might want to do it on the other side. As best I look today, I could not find any good studies that suggest you should get it in the same arm or you should get it in the other arm. So... I think you should just get it where you get it. So Tiffany says, will PCR testing be more readily available for contacts? It would make it easier for people to go back to work sooner than 10 days. It probably wouldn't. PCR testing is the testing that you have to send off to one of the big labs. The turnaround time is still two or three days. To go back to work, you need to get it on the fifth, sixth, or seventh day. So if you got it exactly the fifth day, you might get the results back on the eighth day, which would be two days later than, two day, only two days earlier than the 10th day. Now you also can do one of the rapid tests on the seventh day. You'll definitely get that result back. So what we're recommending is if people want to do it, go back sooner, that they get a test on the seventh day using a rapid test. If, that, if they're still asymptomatic, the rapid test is negative, they can go back to work on the next day. Yeah, so Casey said, I read that ultrasound can destroy coronavirus at the frequency used for diagnostic imaging. So there's a lot of things that kill this virus. This is not a particularly, this is not a particularly potent virus. Sunlight, ultrasound, disinfectants, all of those things kill this virus pretty well. The problem is, by the time you get infected with this, this virus is deep in your tissues and you can get the things that kill it there. So early on there was a story, well, just inhale steam and that'll, that'll get rid of it. The problem is that the temperature of the steam you had to inhale was so hot that it would burn your nose and it would only get the vex, would only get the virus in your nose and almost everybody by the time they were infected had the disease not just in their nose but deeper. So. I'm sure people are looking at things like ultrasound, but it does not seem promising at this point. So Amy says, can I get the J&J &J if I got the Pfizer? Is it safe? So this has not been studied. So the only way it was studied was first dose Pfizer, second dose Pfizer, one dose J&J. &J. There are no studies that people got one dose Pfizer and one dose J&J. &J. Now, theoretically, should it work? It should. But again, nobody studied it, so there's nothing I could tell you for sure. So Jeff says, I'm 43 with underlying conditions and help take care of elderly people. Does this bump me up or do I still have to wait for my age group? Again, the, the sequencing in Oregon is really complicated. It would make a difference of what you do for elderly people. So if you are employed in a nursing home, Yes, you would be eligible if you help elderly people with their taxes. 
you would not be eligible. So it is incredibly fact specific as to whether you would have it or not. Still, we're not doing people yet with underlying conditions or people less than 45. We hope that by the end of March that it'll change, that it'll get people who are 45 to 64 with underlying conditions. So you still wouldn't be eligible then. And taking care of elderly people, again, it's very dependent upon what you do. And some of it doesn't exactly make sense. So if you're a, if you're a plumber employed by a nursing home, yes, you are covered. But if you're a plumber that goes into the houses of old people to fix their, fix their toilets, you are not covered. So it's really, really complicated. So what number do we need to be to go into high? So we need to have less than 200 cases per 100,000 over the two-week period with our, with our population of 112,000. So we would have to have less than 225 cases over that time. When I look most recently, we're a little over 100. So we could still have another 100 cases in the next four days. But if we continue as we have for the last seven days, which is a relatively low rate, we're likely to be in that high range. So Ginger says, two weeks after having COVID, a family member has pneumonia. Would a previous pneumonia vaccine have prevented this, or is it a different pneumonia? Well, pneumonia is one of the more complicated diseases we have. In many diseases, you know exactly what the germ is and exactly what the best antibiotic is. So if I had a urinary tract infection, you pee in a cup, they find what the bacteria is, they classify what bacteria is, E. coli, Klebsiella, something else, and they can tell me what the best antibiotics are. This also happens a little bit like skin infections where they get the pus out or in spinal, or in spinal meningitis where they do a spinal tap and get the fluid. The problem with pneumonia is we almost never figure out what the germ is exactly. So the only ways to figure out what the germ is exactly is to do a test called a bronchoscopy, a very invasive test where you go into the lungs and suck out some of the juices. Even that doesn't always find it. Or you do surgery to do a lung box and you find it that way. So in most times when we say people have pneumonia, we just have to guess what the germ is. Viral pneumonias have one picture. COVID pneumonias have a different kind of picture. Bacterial pneumonias have a slightly different picture, but the overlap is huge, and thus we're never exactly sure. So if you have a pneumococcal pneumonia caused by a bacteria called pneumococcus, then the, then the pneumonia shot, which is a shot against the pneumococcal bacteria, would work. But again, you would want to know what kind of pneumonia it is, and it's really hard to tell. So the question is, would a previous pneumonia vaccine prevented that? The answer is... It all depends. So Veronica says, are there any more variant tests back? No. Every, the people at the office hate me because every day I ask at least once a day, is it back yet? Is it back yet? Is it back yet? The answer is I, I, it's not back yet. And so we do not know about the variants. And so we got our one test back from January, which was positive. We've got none of the tests from February back. Even though we sent them early in February, we have none back from February. So could there be more variants here? Absolutely. How will I know? We have to wait for the test results and it is for me absolutely maddening. So Christy says, I'm on the fence about getting the vaccine. You're not alone. I have a lot of fear around it. For someone who had a bad reaction to a vaccine as a baby, what do you think the risks are to getting it? So again, these vaccines are very different from any vaccine you had as a baby. And so previous reaction to a shot is only a small predictor of a reaction to this. We've done a lot. We've not had a lot of reactions. In fact, at the fairgrounds this weekend, the EMS was waiting and standing by, and they told me they felt like the Maytag repairman. They didn't get a single call. Similarly, we've had response teams at each of our big events, and so now doing over 3,000 doses, we've never had once wherever we needed to use that. So I think the risks are small. Now, risks are statistical, one in a thousand, one in 10,000, one in a million. And so for the people who don't have it, the risks are small. The problem with all risks, they're one in something, and some person has to be that one, and so there's a risk. So you weigh the risks and benefits. So let's suggest, um, uh, so let's suggest what are the, what are the benefits of this? Well, 
the benefits of this that you won't get COVID or die of COVID. And depending upon your age and your risk factor, it's it's different. So at my age, what's my risk for getting COVID? Well, it's not certainly zero. I'm around patients. Uh, I have a job, I'm out and whatever. So my risk of getting COVID is something. I don't do high risk things, but I'm around. You know, when you're seeing patients and where even though everybody's wearing a mask, you certainly could get it. And then what's my risk of dying? My risk of dying is a few percent. It's not huge, but it's a few percent. So if I got it was some of my risk of getting it, uh, one in 300, say in Douglas County, and then my risk of dying from it, about another one in 50. So my risk of dying, that is about one in 1,500. That's not huge, but it's a lot more than my risk of dying in a car wreck in the next year. It's a lot more than my risk of any disease in the next year. So for me, the benefits of the disease, saving a death one in 1,500 times versus the risk, I think the risk of death less than one in a million. Clearly for me, the risks and benefits are there. Now, on the other hand, um, you may view the risks and benefits differently. And so you may choose differently. But I think for almost every adult, the risks of, of getting the vaccine are much smaller than the benefits. So I think in this case, the risk-benefit ratio is in favor of getting the vaccine. So Amy says, will the vaccines be a one-shot booster or another two shots? Absolutely don't know. Um, you would think the way this works is it would be another two shots because the mRNA from these variants that you would get would be different from the original one, and we're not sure how much crossover there would be. So probably we would be two, but we don't know. Sherry says, should a 120-pound person get the same vaccine dose as a 240-pound person? Yeah, or a 480-pound person. And so this becomes an issue in adults. So, you know, we have people who range from 100 to 500 pounds. So there's a 500, there's a five-time dose uh, difference, and that's great. But, you know, when I say, look, I'm in pediatrics, and I could see a kid in the office who was five pounds today, and then the very next kid could be a teenager weight 350, a 70-fold difference. And we've always had that question, should, you, should bigger people get a bigger dose or, a small, or smaller people get a smaller dose? In general, with vaccines, we don't do that. So in general, in vaccines, everybody gets the same dose. So for example, in flu, um, everybody six months and above gets the same dose. And very clearly, there are going to be some six-month-olds who may be 11 pounds, and then you may have some 500-pound people. Um, it's, it's probably correct though, because the immune system works in the same way. Unlike, for example, taking a dose of Tylenol, where you have to get a certain blood level to give you, to give you, um, to give you relief or an antibiotic where this antibiotic has to be distributed over your whole body, uh, to do it. So the dose of an antibiotic would be very clearly different from, for a big adult versus a baby. In this case with the immune system, the immune system, um, the immune system is the immune system, and it's pretty much not that, that much different in a baby than an adult. So, if it takes 50 T cells to recognize this, 50 T cells would be 50 T cells, whether it was a little person or above. But that's a that's a great question, and at some point we might go ahead and do uh, we may do dose uh, weight related doses. So Kim says, why is our county so far behind in vaccinations? Well, the good news is our county is not so far behind in vaccinations. Um, if you look at the CDC website, uh, if, if you look at the, the OHA website, and then you look at the different counties, it looks like Douglas County has vaccinated fewer people than around. But we know that the VA has done over 3,000 doses. Cow Creek has done over 2,500 doses. And neither of these... Neither of these uh, vaccine doses are put into the state alert system. So those 2,500, those at least 5,000, and we think now it's over 6,000 doses given to those places are not there. And that's why Doug, that's one of the reasons Douglas County looks low. So this weekend I was at the event, and one of the things I was the medical screener, and frequently there were two people in the car. And I would go and I'd say, oh, well, we're going to go ahead and do you. What about the other person in the car? Oh, they're a veteran. They've already gotten it. I heard that again and again and again. And the reason is that the vet and those doses, though, that the veterans got are not in the state system. So it looks like Douglas County is low. When I add back the doses that were given to the VA in Cow Creek, it looks like we're actually a little ahead of the state average. 
But I will tell you, it is so maddening to answer this question to the state again and again and again. We're working with Wyden's office. We're working with the governor's office to see if we can go ahead and get this figured out. Um, so Kathy says, so what's your thoughts about the CD saying that if you're vaccinated, you can go without a mask and gather in small groups? What they said was that if you're in groups of other vaccinated people, you don't need to wear a mask. When you're in public or you're around people with unknown vaccination status, you still need to wear a mask. But what do I think about that? I think that makes sense. So the story is if my wife and I are vaccinated, and we will be soon, and we have friends who are both vaccinated, could we meet together for dinner? Right now, until we're all vaccinated, we would not. But could we meet for dinner? And I think the answer is low. And the reason is the chance that any of us would have this is less than one in 20. And the chance that any of us could get this is less than 1 in 20. So the chance of, of one of us passing it to somebody else is less than 1 in 100, in which is probably safer than any of the things we do. That's why they say you could do this. Also, uh, what about uh, low-risk people? So these are grandparents visiting their grandchildren. So vaccinated grandparents visiting their unvaccinated grandchildren. Again, unvaccinated grandchildren are unlikely to spread the disease. And, and if they catch the disease, not likely to get sick. Grandparents who've been vaccinated are unlikely to spread the disease or unlikely to catch the disease. And that's why they've done it. So if you're vaccinated, you do not need to wear a mask when you're around other vaccinated people. However, uh, if you're unsure about the vaccine status of the people, which is in public, you should wear a mask. So what are the symptoms you see with positive patients? So this is a weird, weird, weird disease. Unlike most diseases where you have sort of typical symptoms, this disease has a huge range of symptoms ranging everywhere from maybe 30% of the people who are really asymptomatic. They have no symptoms at all. And even when you ask, you sure nothing, not even a little of this, a little bit of that? No, I feel perfectly fine. So it goes all the way from no symptoms. Most of the people who do have symptoms have a couple of things. One is fever is common, although not early on. So this all fever screening that they were doing at airports and whatever turned out to be not very useful. So fever is common, but not early on. Cough is common later on, but not always in the first few days. This dragging fatigue is one of the things that's common both with the vaccine and with the disease. So people say, boy, I felt like I got run over by a bus. All I want to do is sleep. Some of the people I've talked to with the disease say they're sleeping 20 hours in the day. A loss of smell and taste, very common in people with positive disease. Maybe 40% of the people with the disease report this odd loss of smell or taste. But then there's weird things, diarrhea and abdominal pain. So early on, there were a bunch of people who had the disease. The only symptoms they had were GI symptoms with diarrhea and abdominal pain. And they, um, you know, people didn't think they had COVID because they didn't have fever or cough, and they spread it to lots of people. So there's a story about early on in a Chinese surgical hospital where they had people in with COVID symptoms in one unit, and then this person came to their unit because they had abdominal pain and diarrhea, they had colitis or diverticulitis or something. They, ex they expose a lot of people in the unit. So diarrhea can be there. There are weird rashes. The weirdest of which is which is called COVID toes, where it looks like your toes have frostbite. Who in the world knows why that happens? Um, and then there are some people with... Um, um, with COVID have this funny little eye thing. Early on, there were people who said you could tell people had COVID because they had um, red eyes. Turns out that it's not particularly, uh, it's not particularly predictive, but this is a weird disease that has all of those different symptoms. The problem is that many of the symptoms, upper respiratory symptoms, runny nose and whatever, you can see with just a cold, you can see with sinus, you can see with allergy, you can see with COVID. I cannot tell you the number of people who have gone to work with what they said was a sinus infection, or they went to work with bad allergies, or they went with a cold, turned out a week later to have COVID and spread it to lots of people. So we're not saying everybody with a cold forever should stay home, but during this time when COVID is circulating, if you're feeling sick with any symptoms, you should stay home. 
So Shelby says, how, is, how effective is the vaccine for kids under 18? The results have not been released yet. Now we do know for the Pfizer vaccine for kids 16 to 18 seems to be very effective. And the thought is that both the Pfizer and the, Jane, and the Moderna vaccine will be very effective for kids after puberty. Under puberty, not been adequately studied. So we think it's probably going to go down to 12 and above, maybe this summer, maybe in the fall. So Allison said, are the lower cases reflective of people willing to get a test? I don't think so, because if that were the case, then you'd expect our case positivity rate to go up. So let's say everybody boycotted the test next week. The positive would still be positive, and you'd have very few negatives, and the test positivity rate would go up. Both our, our case rate is down and our test positivity rate is down, suggesting that this is not because people are refusing. So Linda says, is there any way Moderna could cause a cough that would turn into pneumonia? I can't think of a way. So the Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine are snippets of, of messenger RNA that are encased in these little lipid nanoparticles. They get into the cell and they tell your cell for a while to go ahead and make, um, and, and make the protein. It makes the protein. The protein gets to the surface of the cell and then it... Um, and then your body makes antibodies to it. I cannot think of any way that would happen. It wasn't found in any of the trials. So I don't think there's any way. So Janice says, a few weeks ago you said you can't get COVID off surface. I didn't say you can't. I said it's a very unlikely way to get it. So unless you're licking the surfaces or, or licking the bags at the store, and I don't think you can get it. I think the FDA suggests that groceries, grocery bags are not a source of infection and you can use your own bags and stores again. Now, the stores may not want you to do it because they may want you to carry around a, a bag that has their name on it. Um, but medically, there's no particular reason that you couldn't start using your own bags again. Uh, have you heard of anyone getting Moderna then wanting a J&J for boost? Uh, I guess I heard about that today. Again, hasn't been studied. Now, would it, theoretically, should it work? Maybe, but until it's studied, you can't tell for sure. Would they get sick? They sh wouldn't get sick with it. They might still get the same kind of side effects that you'd expect after a vaccine. But again, it hasn't been studied, unless there would be an incredibly good reason to do it. And I heard, heard of one person today with a moderate reason for doing it. They had a significant reaction to the first shot. So if you had a significant reaction to the first shot, to the first shot of Moderna or Pfizer, you could be really reluctant to get the Pfizer or Moderna again. And that was the one person where it might make sense to get the J&J. &J. I would love that for somebody to study that, right? We know a number of people have bad reactions to that. I'd really love them to do a study where they give them J&J &J and see, do you get it still a bad reaction and does it work? There's no way for me to know with onesies, twosies, whether this is going to do it. But this is the things we need to study. All right, we have another, well, then we have a little computer glitch here. While we get that, let me go back to an older question that I had earlier in this week. All right. Um, okay. So the question, I don't, I can't find it here, but the question was, tell me a little bit of how this mRNA works. Does it get into the nucleus of the cell? How long does it last? So again, mRNA is the equivalent of the post-it note where you look back on the recipe and you type it on the post-it note and bring that rather than bringing the book to the place where you're working. So the mRNA uh, is made in the, normally in the cells um, to tell cells how to make proteins. Uh, the mRNA uh, typically lasts a day or two or three and then self-destructs, like that old thing from um, Mission Impossible, and then it self-destructs. So it doesn't stick around. It, may, it tells the cells to make the protein 
for a couple of days and then goes away. And that's why messenger RNA is the ideal candidate for these vaccines because it doesn't stick around. So mRNA lasts for a while and then goes away. There were concerns that, you know, maybe it would stick around and cause me to make the spike protein forever, and then maybe I would have this constant allergic reaction. It does not, and that's why the messenger RNA is so great. And how do you know this? What they do is they've done this, and they look at studies, and they can measure the amount of this messenger RNA in the cells, and they can see that it goes away in, really goes down away very quickly after day, and by two or three days, you can't find it anymore. The other question was about this theory that there's somehow nanoparticles or, or bots or something or trackers or something in this vaccine. Well, um, there, there's certainly nothing to that. Uh, and people have really obviously looked for this. So you could take a vial of this vaccine, look under scanning electron microscope and see if they're there. Uh, there's not there when you look at it under a microscope. So to to do it, they would have had to create a bot or a tracking device that, you, that was so small that you couldn't see with the most powerful microscope, that was invisible because it didn't show up, had some new battery technology that nobody has ever thought of, and uh, would somehow with a thing that small be able to produce enough radio waves that it would be a tracker. So again, not only is there's no, no idea that there would be a tracker in there, if anybody could figure out how to have put a tracker in there, it would be one of the most amazing technological developments ever. And so if you're worried about trackers being in there, there aren't being any trackers in there. As somebody said, though, we all carry around trackers. And so for people who don't want to be tracked, please don't use a smartphone. This smartphone is spooky how much it knows. And at the end of the month, Google gives me your timeline, where you've been. And it shows me every place I walked and every store I went to and every place I went. So if you don't want to get tracked, please don't use a cell phone. Okay, let's see what else we got here. All right, so hopefully we got done with our glitch here. There was a big glitch today in the in the vaccine system too. There we go. All right. Um, can the county provide quick tests for responsible employers? I don't know what that means. Um, so I, again, I don't know what that means. Uh, we do have tests that we distribute to people. Um, the test has to be done by somebody with a CLIA license, and so you just can't do the tests. You have to have, employers couldn't do the tests. Um, they would need to, they would need to have a CLIA license. But yes, we work with, with employers all the time on getting them testing. So I work with the municipality today. I work with another business today about ways to get them tests. So when does the case county start, case collection for the thing start? It starts, it started uh, nine days ago and it's gonna continue until this Saturday night. So, so far, we're looking good. You know, the numbers are looking good. Unless something really bad happens in the next couple of days, we're likely to, we're likely to get down into the high range and out of the extreme range, and that would be great. So keep up the good work for the next, uh, for the next part of the week, and we'll, and we'll see what, what happens there. Uh, let's see, any more questions there? So the so uh, one of the other questions that's big this week is about the AstraZeneca vaccine. So the AstraZeneca vaccine was made by the drug company AstraZeneca and the University of Oxford. It uses a weakened chimp adenovirus, and so it's different from many of the vaccines that are that are currently available. It has been tested in the UK and in Brazil and other places. It has had a checkered past. They had some early neural uh, immune kind of reactions to this that weren't promptly reported, so people were a little worried about this. They had a dosing error in their vaccine in the people who got this in Brazil. That worried people that you would have a dosing error. And then this vaccine has been problematic and that they've had a really hard time getting people back for their follow-up vaccine. Again, it's a two-dose vaccine. So much so that 
it's all over the board what the recurring time is. It also was pulled in South Africa because it was felt not to be particularly effective against the South African variant. And now what they're seeing is that a bunch of countries in Europe have pulled the AstraZeneca vaccine because they're worried about side effects, most specifically um, um, thromboembolism and thrombocytopenia. So thromboembolism means blood clots in your legs. That happens. I mean, especially when we're using this vaccine for old people that then sometimes get loose and then go into your lungs and cause something called a pulmonary embolism. That would be bad. Uh, or they break off from other places and get into your brain and cause a stroke. That's bad. Now, what I'll tell you, though, is that this vaccine has been used mostly on old sick people. Old sick people. People in nursing homes. And us old people do get thromboembolism. We do get pulmonary embolism, we do get strokes. And so what they say is that the overall rate of these events is not different in the people who got the vaccine from what you would expect from this age group of people. And so there's been some criticism about these countries that have stopped using the vaccine. The thing that's a little scary though is that there are a number of cases in Norway and now one case in Ireland where people have had both clotting things and low levels of platelets. So typically, when you have low levels of platelets, you, it's not you don't clot, you bleed. I mean, low levels of platelets happen from lots of things and you bleed. And when you have a clot, you typically have a, a normal or high number of platelets. So the people in Norway were worried because these people, the, the three in Norway and the one in Ireland, so only four people had, had the combination of low platelets and unusual clotting, which is so weird that you would have both at the same time. And that's why they were worried about it. Maybe that's why they pulled it. We'll have to see what happens. Um, we'll, have to, we'll have to see what happens with that AstraZeneca vaccine. I think when there's a question, I think pulling it, studying it is a great thing. Unfortunately, proving a negative, proving that the vaccine wasn't the reason that people had this is really hard to do, and I'm not sure what's going to happen with the AstraZeneca vaccine. The good news is it's really unlikely the AstraZeneca vaccine is ever going to be used in the U.S. anyway. And the reason for that is that uh, we already have these three other safe and effective vaccines. It looks like the Novavax vaccine, which is a protein, uh, a protein vaccine, is uh, also going to come on the market. So we're going to have four very effective vaccines. Not exactly clear that we need a fifth, as well as we didn't order very many. And so it really doesn't make sense to go and order a bunch of this new va of this vaccine when we already have three really good ones. Um, so Jackie says, is the vaccine safe for those who've had a severe allergic reaction to a flu shot? So again, you should talk with your doctor about that. In general, however, that what's in the flu shot and what's in this vaccine are very different. Now, we do know that there are some people who just are more prone to allergic reactions than, than others. Right? There's some people who have no allergies, and then there's some people who are allergic to a bunch of things, fish, shellfish, latex, other kinds of things. So we think that people who have had allergic reactions to flu shot are a little bit more likely to have a reaction to this vaccine just because their, alert, their immune system is on, is on guard more for allergies. I will tell you that this weekend we had a lot of people who'd had previous reactions. And again, of the 700 people we did, not a single one of them had a, a reaction. So that's the good news. Again, talk with your doctor, but again, you need to weigh the risks and the benefits. And the risks and benefits are different for different people. So the benefits for me is I'm older, I'm in the public, I could get really sick. So the benefits for me are great. Never had an allergic reaction. To, to anything, so my risks are very small. So for me, clearly, in it does that. So let's say, on the other hand, you'd had life-threatening reactions to many things, shellfish, bee stings, allergies, in which case the risk for you of the vaccine would be higher. And if you were otherwise healthy 34-year-old, the benefits to you, because your risk of dying or being hospitalized is lower, in which case your risks and benefits may be closer, and you may decide not to do it. This is also the reason that we're very, very cautious about vaccine in, te in teens, especially for this disease, because the risk for teens is very low. 
So if we look at the risk of death for a teen versus an 80-year-old, it's 8,000 times different, not 8,000 percent, 8,000 times different. And so the benefit for an 80-year-old on this vaccine is enormous. The benefit for a 15-year-old, not, not enormous. And the risk of an allergic reaction for a 15-year-old is a lot of allergic reactions may be high. So the risks and benefit are different. But I will tell you, for almost every adult, certainly for every adult over 30, I think the benefits of this vaccine are, are, are great. And unless you have a really unusual risk history, the benefits are almost always going to be greater than the risks. When we get down to six-year-olds, I don't know what the answer on that is, but I think for right now, uh, if you've had a severe allergic reaction to flu shot, I think your chance of having a reaction to this is really quite low, and I would definitely recommend that you talk to your doctor and consider getting the vaccine. Okay, we're coming to the end here. Um, thank you for all the questions. Again, if you have a longer question that you want us to answer in detail, please put them at Facebook questions at douglaspublichealthnetwork.org. If you're in group 1A and want a vaccine, please send us an email at vaccines at douglaspublichealthnetwork.org. If you're in the educator group, didn't get a vaccine before, want one now, send us an email at educatorvaccines at douglaspublichealthnetwork.org. I'll stop talking for a minute. If you want to run and get a pen and do it. The one challenge we have for this week is to uh, think about how you would set up a reasonably workable standby system. So it's, it's at the end of the day, you have 50 doses left. So we were at the fairgrounds this weekend. We had some doses left. What we did is a Facebook Live. All these people came streaming in and we got rid of all the doses. The problem was that was great if you happen to be watching my Facebook Live. Not sure why you would do that on a Saturday afternoon, but good for people who did that. Good for people who had a car, people who had gas in their car, and good for people who live within 10 minutes. Not particularly good if you lived in Days Creek. Not particularly good if you don't watch me on, on Facebook, which is probably smart. And not good if you were poor and needed to take the bus. So that worked out okay for the people who got it, but maybe didn't work out well for others. So if you can think of a way that we could do a standby system that would be fair, equitable, easy for people to use, and would be doable, we can do that. So this last weekend we did the Facebook Live. It worked and that people got the vaccine, but I wasn't sure it worked that well. In the past, we did a standby where we had people sign up for the event, and then at the end, if they wanted to get one, they did it. That only worked, that did not work well, because then we had to call people on the day and tell them to come in, and we only got about a third of the people on the phone, so you had to call a, you had to call a lot of people to get people in, and then some people were busy or whatever else, so that didn't work well. We could tell people we're going to post it at a certain time, but you're smarter than me about this, so give us advice, and just put this on the chat section here, of how you would design the standby system, because I think... That's an important thing, an important thing to get right. And nobody I've talked to in the state yet has a good way to do it. Again, the, the uh, email for the people who ran to get a pencil here, it's for Facebook, it's Facebook questions at douglaspublichealthnetwork.org. All big one long word. People ask us, why do you have such a freaking long thing? Well, DPHN was taken at the time we were going to do it. Uh, so douglaspublichealthnetwork.org. For questions, it's Facebook questions at DouglasPublicHealthNetwork.org. For 1A, people who, who didn't get a vaccine before but want to get it now, it's vaccines at DouglasPublicHealthNetwork.org. For educators who want to get vaccines and didn't get them before, it's educator vaccines at DouglasPublicHealthNetwork.org. All right, so that's my challenge today. The other question I would have is that on the next Friday, so 10 days from now, uh, a bunch of people are going to be on spring break. Thank, thank goodness for them. And we're not going to be able to do this in our usual way. If we weren't going to do Facebook Live in our usual way, tell us how you would like us to do it on that day. I'll be around and do it. But the people who help me with the studio and the lights and all the questions won't be around. So if we were going to do something different, how would we do it? We could do best of. We could do... Um, pre-planned questions, so I'll do the questions before. There's lots of different ways to do it, so tell me how you'd like to do it. All right, we're coming to the end here. Thank you all. Uh, again, we're really at the crossroads here. 
the best case scenario. I can see it so clearly that by this this fall, COVID is not the top three stories on the news. You barely hear about it. Um, would still be around, but it, you know we're pretty much done with it. School is good. The fair is normal. Things are great. But I can equally easily see the worst case scenario where it comes June and we're still dealing with 50,000 cases in the U.S. We're still having deaths. We're still having hospitalizations. And there's more and more of these variants. So I promise you it's going to be somewhere in between. So again, this is Dr. Bob Danhofer, Public Health Officer, Douglas County. Be safe and be kind. Thank you.